Hello, we're here with Senator Marco Elias, who is seeking the position of Lieutenant Governor. Would you like to go ahead with the one or two minute introduction? Well, thank you, Nicole, and thanks to the Endorsement Committee uh, for the chance to uh, chat with you tonight. I'm Marco Elias, a lifelong Washingtonian, a state senator and college professor and a candidate for Lieutenant Governor, uh, really uh, running for three main reasons. One, I believe I'm the most qualified candidate in the race uh, with the strongest progressive record and ambitious plans uh, for the office. Uh, I'll start with my qualifications. For the last three years, I've served as the Senate Majority Floor Leader uh, with responsibility for drafting the Senate's parliamentary rules, scheduling all of our bills for floor action, and serving as our liaison to the Lieutenant Governor's office. Uh, and it's uh, those experiences uh, that led our, our, our current Lieutenant Governor, Cyrus Habib, to endorse my campaign, calling me the most qualified candidate running. I'm also proud of my strong progressive record on a whole host of issues, just to highlight a few, uh, proud of my 96% lifetime rating uh, with the State Labor Council, uh, A rating uh, from NARAL Pro-Choice Washington, my commitment to women's reproductive justice, uh, also an A-plus rating uh, from the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, uh, proud to have been a leader on trying to reduce gun violence in our communities. I've also led the fight on improving equity in education. Most recently in uh, this 2020 session, I led the effort to pass a new subsidized student loan program for our undocumented students who aren't able to access subsidized federal loans. Uh, so to even the playing field and ensure that all of our students have access to all the tools uh, to fund their education. Uh, also uh, led the effort to ban conversion therapy and would be the first openly LGBTQ uh, statewide elected official. Um, and have voted to repeal the death penalty three times, have been a leader on climate, in fact, taken the no fossil fuel money pledge in our campaign. In terms of ambitious plans, I wanna focus primarily on three things. I'll work on rebuilding our economy and protecting the social safety net in this moment. Also wanna work on expanding access to higher education and improving uh, pathways to career and to workforce training, and wanna make uh, equity and social justice at the uh, put it at the center of our work in the state policy process and come up with some equity and social justice tools. Thank you, Senator. Great, thank you. Um, and I see that the questions have been posted in here. Um, there are four total. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and call in this order, guys. I forgot to mention this. Kelsey, Lori, Brittany, then Sherry. So Kelsey, would you take question one, please? Of course. Um, so what would your priority policy areas be as Lieutenant Governor? And these are two I'm main responses. Sorry. Perfect. I'm glad that I uh, didn't spend as much time on that in my intro because we have a chance to dive a little bit deeper. As I shared uh, in my introductory comments, I uh, want to prioritize three areas. I uh, want to work on economic recovery and also economic development. The Lieutenant Governor chairs a joint committee on econo economic development and trade international trade issues and would really want to focus that on green recovery and green transition. How do we make sure that we're building a more resilient, more sustainable economy as we emerge from this crisis? Also want to focus on our small and medium-sized businesses and making sure that we're helping them uh, in this important path of recovery and in economic development. When it comes to expanding access to higher education and creating more pathways to opportunity and to career, I uh, really want to build on the work that our current Lieutenant Governor has done uh, to down barriers of access. This year, uh, Lieutenant Governor sponsored, uh, requested a number of uh, pieces of legislation to help improve access and equity uh, in our higher education space. Want to build on that work. Uh, I partnered with them on trying to move to one unified college application uh, so that students in Washington who are applying to our state colleges would just have to go to one place uh, to access higher education. We got the bill passed, but because of the fiscal crisis we're in, the governor was forced to veto it. So I want to return back to that work and continue on with that. And then from an equity perspective, really, as I shared, want to put equity and social justice at the center of what we're doing in the legislature. Uh, every bill we pass uh, gets a fiscal note to assess the fiscal impacts. I want to help develop a tool to help us do equity analysis uh, on seconds. all the policies that we're moving. Um, we have uh, some equity tools and lenses we can use, but I believe that we need a more rigorous methodology. We want to work with the Office of Equity with our ethnic women's and LGBT commissions, leaders and legislators of color uh, to really intentionally embed equity in our policymaking process. Those would be uh, my early priorities and obviously want to work on a whole host of other issues to move our progressive agenda forward as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Lori, question two, please. Thank you. Uh, and it's a multi-part, so bear with me. If you win, there's a chance you might become governor if Jay Inslee is appointed to a post in a Biden administration. 
you'd also be facing a budget crisis due to the impact of coronavirus. How would you deal with that budget crisis? Regressive taxation strains our low and middle income families and reduced revenue collection curtails our ability to invest in vital infrastructure. Will you pledge to veto budget cuts to needed public services? And what taxes might you look at to raise uh, in order to deal with the crisis? Well, absolutely, 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 we must uh, fund our critical safety net services. I served in the legislature through the last recession uh, when the Gregoire administration really took an all cuts approach uh, to solving that economic crisis. Uh, and it devastated the safety net. It's taken us a decade to build back uh, many of those services just uh, to catch up to the cuts we made in the last recession. So uh, strongly opposed uh, to an austerity approach. Uh, I think it's unwise to, for any leader to say they would veto something specific until we know where we're at. I would tell you uh, equivocally, unequivocally, that uh, I would oppose an austerity and an all cuts approach. I would insist on uh, new progressive revenue. The three that immediately come to mind are closing the loophole on capital gains uh, here at, at the state level, also uh, doubling the estate tax uh, and, Im and implementing a tax along the lines of what my colleague Senator Wen and a supporter of our campaign uh, introduced this year to uh, create a BNO uh, excise on exec uh, excessive executive compensation uh, at our large companies where you've got the gap between the CEOs making you know hundreds of times more than the frontline workers. Uh, those would be three uh, progressive revenue sources I would look at immediately and would vigorously oppose and would use all the tools in my disposal, including considering uh, vetoes of budgets that took an all cuts or austerity only approach. Great, thank you. Uh, Brittany, would you take question three? Can you, um, do you support a just transition to deal with climate change, such as the Green New Deal, which would bring carbon emissions down to zero in the next decade or two, while investing in those most impacted, who are often low-income, marginalized communities of color? A hundred percent yes, and you heard this in sort of my priorities. In terms of economic development, I want to make, uh, you know, a green transition here at the state level, a cornerstone of our work to build our economy and grow resiliency into the future. Uh, strongly support uh, at the federal level an investment like the Green New Deal and would wanna look to mirror those investments. Although I will claim credit here in Washington, we've had a clean energy fund uh, and other investments for a decade uh, that have been making uh, progress in this regard. And so would wanna continue those efforts. Uh, and absolutely, we need to do a much better job of getting uh, uh, the communities that are most impacted uh, by the effects of climate change to the table to discuss this. I was sitting in a Senate Environment Committee hearing on a climate proposal and my colleague uh, Mona Doss, a wonderful new legislator from South King County, also an endorser of our campaign, uh, pointed out that there were no people of color in the audience to testify on this issue affecting uh, all of our communities, but particularly we know uh, impacting our low income uh, and uh, communities of color more. So. Uh, we've got great organizations like Front and Centered and other uh, communities of color advocacy groups that are entering and, and dialoguing in the climate space. We need to lift those voices up, have them at the table, and recognize that uh, for so many of our communities, it is our small and medium-sized businesses who need help becoming more resilient. Often those are ways that our communities of color start building gener intergenerational wealth, and we need to make sure that our minority business community is at the table for these uh, important decisions as well. And it's part of why I think baking equity and social justice into all the work we do is critical. Uh, this seconds. issue is no exception. Great. Great. Thank you. And uh, Sherry, would you be willing to take out question number four? She might have, I think she might have cut herself off. Let's, um, Robert, would you take question number four? Yep, sure thing. Uh, will you support efforts to combat the economic impacts of systemic racism by supporting policies that target inequality in areas like housing, education, and intergenerational wealth? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's, again, just to return back to my opening comments, why we have to put equity and social justice as a lens on all the decisions we're making. Uh, the reality is our structure uh, began as a, a white uh, racist structure uh, back when our country was founded, uh, founded on a, a history of racism and, and slavery and oppression of native peoples. Uh, but some of the policies we're seeing today, it's really benign neglect where legislators didn't realize or didn't think through or didn't consider equity impacts. And it's why we have to embed an equity and social justice lens in everything that we do. Uh, but certainly when we think about 
housing and displacement issues. We need to have communities of color at the table helping us develop solutions that preserve uh, community, historic communities uh, and ensure that we're also meeting the needs of the housing gaps that we've got in our society. Uh, in education, as I outlined in higher education in particular, I feel like we have a lot of work to do uh, to improve access. Same with early learning, and we've made a lot of progress in K-12, but still uh, room to go there. Uh, and intergenerational wealth, it's why I'm really committed to working with small and medium-sized businesses, particularly in historically marginalized communities, uh, because it's really important when we look at the data nationwide, you'll find that uh, white families on average have 10 times the wealth accumulated, $800,000 or $600,000 versus black families across the United States on average having $60,000 in assets. We have to correct this, and that comes through helping business formation, helping folks uh, buy that first home and save up. Uh, I also, uh, another idea I want to lift up is the idea of uh, setting up a college savings account for every child born in Washington to help every family begin accumulating the resources uh, to access higher ed and opportunity as well. Those are some of the issues, but again, having an equity and social justice lens on all our policy areas will help us tackle these endemic problems uh, and tear down the systems of oppression that we see. Great, thank you. Um, now we're moving into our uh, follow-up questions and the responses to those would be one minute apiece. Um, I see hands. Uh, let's go with Brittany. I see yours first. Uh, you were a leader on the uh, extremely important ban of conversion therapy in Washington State. What other policy priorities could we be exploring as a state to help the LGBTQ community? Uh, thank you. I think um, we definitely need to do more work uh, to help our transgender community. We uh, still see overlapping and intersectional uh, challenges for trans uh, folks across the state. I also think we've got to tackle um, the more politically challenging uh, but important uh, issues facing uh, sex workers, people who use drugs, uh, elements of the LGBT community where there's intersections with poverty and oppression. Um, this year, I tried to make some progress on improving uh, our uh, STI response efforts. Uh, but again, there, the cost of responding are cited as a, a challenge, but we know that folks are needlessly suffering because we aren't uh, adequately treating STIs like the public health emergency that they are for so many people. So I think the next set of issues in the LGBT community, now that we've taken down uh, really formal discrimination, is looking at the intersectional challenges of poverty, lack of opportunity, marginalization, and where can we create better access to healthcare, better access to human services, better connections to housing, uh, and build a robust safety net that helps all of our people and recognize that the intersectional challenges for LGBT and queer folks in these spaces are even more, uh, even more challenging and we've got to really uh, build up systems to deal with it. The commission's gonna be a great partner in figuring out uh, answers to this, our new LGBTQ commission. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeff. Hi, Senator. Thanks for being here. I've um, followed your career since you entered the legislature, I think, 12 years ago, and you've done a lot of really good work. Uh, one exception, a few years back, uh, you had supported some payday lender bills that were supported by payday lenders who'd also contributed to your campaign. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to address that. Yeah, that's great. You know, um, I think uh, over the 12 years, there's a lot of things I uh, wish I could have done differently. Uh, and that is uh, definitely first and foremost on the list. Uh, you know, I come from a first generation family and I've had folks in my family uh, that have struggled to pay their bills. And so I wanted to enter the space to provide uh, some constructive ideas to help improve the costs of lending. Uh, but, you know, I, I really started at it from the wrong direction, which is working with industry voices rather than listening uh, to communities of color and those that advocate for folks in poverty. Uh, you know, in 2016, uh, I shared in that campaign that um, <clears throat> I regretted that decision. I wouldn't sponsor that bill again and haven't supported it since. Uh, and I really tried to, in the last four years, demonstrate um, a, a new perspective on these issues, uh, working with communities of color, working with uh, advocates against poverty uh, to uh, tackle things like the student debt crisis, uh, also to examine ways that we can improve access to credit and lending uh, that don't enrich the payday loan industry. Uh, look forward to continuing those efforts. It was a mistake. I, I totally would not support that and would uh, regret that I did that uh, and have tried to demonstrate in the last four years through the work we've done on the student seconds. debt crisis, uh, a different approach that partners with advocates for communities of color and those experiencing poverty to really unwind systems of oppression <clears throat> rather than the reverse. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robert. 
Yeah, so how do we save sound transit from financial doom uh, from the combination of I-976 and now massive collapse in revenues from the coronavirus so that we're not having to choose between funding public schools, social safety net, taking care of the climate and stopping the coronavirus? Yeah, that's a, a one of those central questions uh, that we'll face. Uh, I'm proud when I, I should have mentioned at the outset, I sponsored Sound Transit 3, uh, the proposal that ultimately led to the ballot. Uh, I'm proud that we added the property tax as a source of revenue for Sound Transit so that they are not solely stuck uh, with, with cyclical revenues like uh, sales tax. It's not a large, uh, it's not a majority of their revenue, but it does create some more stability for them. Um, and, you know, I've tried to, to work on this challenge in Olympia of how do we uh, find a path forward on uh, car tabs that satisfy folks like my constituents who feel frustration about the valuation tables uh, and find, uh, you know, but still provide the resources for uh, light rail. So these issues are complex. We haven't been able to find the answer candidly on how to make uh, the tax system and the, the structure of the MVET Ten work seconds. for people. Uh, but I think we've got to certainly at this point invest more in early delivery of light rail and we have to keep working on ways that we can balance uh, the, the sources of revenue for them to ensure we get what we need. Great, thank you. Uh, Mackenzie. Yes, thank you, Senator. Um, I noticed in your campaign, you have a couple of healthy donations from uh, charter schools packs. So I was curious of your opinion of charter schools as a whole. Yeah, in this campaign, I don't. But in 2018, when I ran for re-election to the Senate, we did, uh, we were trying to collect as much as support as we could so we could surplus it to help uh, elect Democrats up and down the ticket. And I'm proud that I was able to surplus about $100,000 to help us uh, win a couple new Senate seats. So in that campaign, uh, you know, when uh, advocates for charter schools offered to contribute, I took the money and gave it to the caucus to help elect uh, great champions for public education. I don't support expanding uh, our existing charter school law. I opposed our existing charter school law uh, at the ballot. Um, and I think that we need to really focus on our uh, public schools and expanding access and ensuring the quality of our existing public schools is strengthened that that's our priority. Uh, charter schools are not a priority for me, uh, but as a member of the Senate leadership, uh, we got a lot of offers uh, for help and I might have to help uh, route that to our candidates. And, and so that's the explanation for, uh, for that support in the 2018 campaign. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. I do apologize. And that was from your last campaign, correct? Thank you. Yeah. No, it's a good question. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to explain it. Uh, are there any other questions we have? Nicole, I have a time question. for one more. Sure, go ahead. So this is a little bit more esoteric, but the lieutenant governor's, the, the position of lieutenant governor has some, in some ways some sort of inherent limitations on the actual policy making. I wonder what you see as the the balance between, do you see it as a kind of um, messaging platform or like a an ideas platform? Or do you really think that you can use the office to um, really craft policy? I, I want to, I think it's, uh... On the limited scope of issues I've talked around, around economic development, sharing the Joint Committee, working on higher ed coordination, and working on developing an equity tool and a social justice lens for the legislative work, those are areas where I believe the Lieutenant Governor's formal authority uh, is at play. When it comes to advancing universal access to health care along a Medicare for all or single payer system, which I support, or taking urgent action on climate change, which, which I support, or ending mass incarceration, which I support. In those areas, I think the Lieutenant Governor has to rely on what Teddy Roosevelt called the bully pulpit. Uh, that is that sort of position of moral authority and the messaging uh, and speaking out. So on the issues I've identified as core priorities, those are ones where I believe that the Lieutenant Governor's formal authority and, and position within the process uh, would, would allow me to take action. Uh, but on the broader set of progressive issues, uh, totally agree that the bully pulpit and that position of messaging and moral authority. So I think I would use a balance, but also make sure we're using our authority the best we can. Great, thanks. Thank you. All right, um, and I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to uh, do a minute uh, close, wrap up. Well, thanks so much uh, for the opportunity to be with you. Uh, we're building 
a strong people-powered progressive campaign. I, I should highlight some of the support we received early on. The National LGBTQ Victory Fund endorsed us out of the gate. Our Federation of State Employees have endorsed us, as well as a dozen of my colleagues, including uh, our new progressive members that were elected in 2018. Diverse, amazing, dynamic voices like Senator Doss, Senator Joe Wen, Senator Emily Randall, Senator Claire Wilson, and of course, your very own Senator Reuben Carlisle has also uh, joined our campaign. Really proud of the community leaders of hundreds of grassroots donors who are helping us build this campaign. And just a reminder, we're not taking any fossil fuel money uh, in our efforts. We're prioritizing the health of our communities ahead of fossil fuel profits in this race. So I'll just close uh, by inviting you and asking you uh, to join our, grow, our strong and growing progressive people-powered campaign uh, to chart a bold and inclusive vision for the future of Washington that lifts all our people up and gets us through this crisis uh, with our innovative and community-minded spirit that we've Great, thank you.